from New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and more than 1,200 leading retail stores from coast to coast presents Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's immortal character, the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes, starring John Stanley. <laughs> this week's story... The Adventure of Dr. Winthrop's Notorious Carriage. Are you accusing your husband, Mrs. Winthrop? My husband's lost his love for me, Mr. Holmes. He's betrayed me. I have no reason to defend him. I see. Lately, he's been impossible. He behaves like a sadistic lunatic. Well, we better move quickly, Holmes. Look into this so-called accident. Yes, Watson. But we must move cautiously if we value our own lives. For this is an elusive killer we seek. Of great talent. A talent for slaughter. In a sudden and completely unexpected way. Put on a fine Clippercraft summer suit, and you find it delightfully light, cool, and comfortable. Wear it a while, and you notice your Clippercraft suit keeps its smart appearance long after other suits are wilted, crumpled, and baggy. The amazing way a Clippercraft lightweight suit holds its lines is assured by Clippercraft's master tailoring and Clippercraft's careful selection of fine summer fabrics. Try on a Clippercraft suit tomorrow, and you'll see what we mean. You'll be delighted to see how little you have to pay. A tropical weight Clippercraft summer suit costs only thirty-three seventy-five to forty-two fifty, and your new suit will be envied by men who usually pay many, many dollars more. You save all that money through the unique Clippercraft plan, whereby more than twelve hundred independent merchants from coast to coast pool their tremendous buying power. You get the benefit. Wear a Clippercraft summer suit and feel better, look better, and save money. Well, Dr. Watson, who rode in Dr. Winthrop's notorious carriage? Well, Mr. Harris, this adventure with Holmes occurred in the early 1900s. It began backstage at one of London's most famous theaters. It was in the dressing room of Margaret Ashley, an exquisite and very popular young actress. Her performance for that evening had ended, and Margaret had a visitor, a Dr. Charles Winthrop. I've made up my mind, Charles. I'm going to your wife. I'm going to see Elizabeth. Are you, Margaret? I shall tell her that I adore you, that you and I have been sweethearts all these months. I shall ask her to give you your freedom. I think she will, too. Well, it's very touching. And very foolish. Well, why do you say that? My word, you've an appalling, self-centered mind, Margaret. Like many women, you believe that simply because you want something, you'll automatically get it. My wife would not be struck at all by the magic of our romance. To her, this would be a rather cheap, sordid business. An insult to her ego. Being a mature and poised woman, she'd take this with an air of dignity and tolerance, but... In her heart of hearts, I'm afraid she'd be furious. Well, then let her be. Are you satisfied with these desperate, dangerous meetings? You're coming to my flat if and when you can find the time, if and when you can somehow lie to Elizabeth? Well, it has been difficult, yes, but... I'm sick of it. I shan't tolerate it. We must face it, Margaret. We must do as best we can. I'll tell you you're tired of her. That you love me. That you see her only as a dowdy, bedraggled housewife. That your marriage was wrong to begin with. It's nothing more nor less than an exercise in boredom. Now, look, Margaret, I want you to control yourself. Control myself? In heaven's name, why? I want you and I'm going to fight to keep you. When a thing is wrong, must you go on and on and on with it? I said you will not tell Elizabeth. Nothing on earth could stop me. I will. What do you mean? You knew I was married, Margaret. You knew the terms of the bargain. You accepted them gladly. But we love each other. Do we? Now, listen to me. You made a great romance out of this. I didn't. You wanted to believe I was in love with you, that I couldn't live without you, simply to please yourself, to cover up the truth. What truth? That this has all been just a lark for me. That I was attracted to you because you're very beautiful, and that's all. And that is all, Margaret. It begins and ends there. I don't think it does. Oh, yes. It's taken years for me to become a reputable physician, Margaret. It's taken every ounce of strength and every moment of time I had to achieve a position in my profession and in society. I have a well-ordered household. I have a decent, honest wife who... 
who loves me. You're not going to place a bomb under that structure. Oh, yes, I am, Charles. Now that you've told me how you really feel, I'll give you a taste of my vengeance. I'll wreck your home and your life, and I don't think for one moment that I can. You'll do nothing of the sort. And do you know why? Do you know why you won't say a word to my wife? Go on. Tell me. Because if you do, I'll kill you. He'll never do that. You could never get away with it. You underestimate me, Margaret. I haven't an ordinary mind. I have a way, a wonderful way. Remember that. And remember, if you go to Elizabeth, I'll murder you. <laughs> Miss Ashley. Shall I call a cab for you, miss? Yes, Peter. It might be a bit difficult, miss. It's awfully late. You're the last to be leaving the theatre. I wanted to avoid the crowd that's always here at the stage door, Peter. I'm exhausted. I couldn't possibly write an autograph or smile at anyone. <laughs> Your gentleman caller hasn't been here in a few days, eh, miss? No, he hasn't. That's such a fine gentleman. I certainly miss those tips of his, I do. The cab, Peter, please, please. Uh, uh, I hear a carriage coming now, miss. M perhaps it's a cab. Yeah. He'll be having a talk with a bobby, he will, ripping down the alley at that speed. Well, look out, miss! He's driving right at you! <laughs> He's knocked a gun! Stop! Come back here, you! Stop! Stop! Oh. He's killed her! He's killed her! <laughs> Elizabeth, I must speak to you. Yes, Charles, dear. It's about this item in the newspaper. Oh, one of your patients in trouble? No. Uh, read that, please. Oh, yes. Yes, I heard about that terrible accident. And Margaret Ashley was such a lovely young actress. It was a horrible, premature death for her. Elizabeth, darling, I... I don't know how to tell you this, but I must. I want you to try to understand... Understand what, Charles? Darling, you seem so distraught. What's wrong with you? Well, there'll be an investigation. The police will be after the driver of that carriage, the man who locked her down and then drove off. Well, yes, of course they will, and I hope they find them, too. Insane, brutal to drive so carelessly. Well, the police suspect that it wasn't an accident. The doorman's testified that the driver of the carriage seemed to go deliberately out of his way to hit her. Oh, Charles, they suspect murder? Yes, yes, they'll probe very deeply. The most intimate details of Margaret Ashley's life will be exposed to public view, and so, Elizabeth, before you find out some other way, I must tell you. Tell me what, dear? I knew Margaret Ashley. Oh, yes? It wasn't a passing acquaintance. I was seeing her regularly. I visited her flat whenever I had the chance. She was in love with me. Oh. You were... Sweethearts, Charles. Is that it? Yes. I, I... I've no excuse. It's... But it's just... Just some... Mysterious element in the chemistry of a marriage that... Does that to a man. I'm prepared to do whatever you say, Elizabeth. Well, Charles, it's... Uh, it's quite hard for me to say anything at all. It's... It's very difficult for me to face it, dear. I... I... I I'm so sorry, Elizabeth. Terribly sorry. Well, have you any idea who might have killed her? I know. Charles. Yes? Charles, did you kill Margaret Ashley? Uh, of course not. How could you think such a thing? Now, Charles, don't lie. Don't try to live with a lie like that. You, you've told me some of the story. Please tell me the rest. I've got to know, Charles. Please, please, did you kill her? Did you drive the carriage that awful night? No. No, I did not. I did not! Listen to me. I might try to forgive an escapade of yours, but I couldn't forgive murder. Now, you must tell me. Will you let go of me? You're out of your mind accusing me. You did kill her. I can sense it in your eyes. Your hands are trembling. I've never seen an expression on your face like that before. Shut I up! Know it. Now, get hold of yourself. Don't ever say that again. Is that clear? If you ever say that again, you won't live to say another word.
I have to tell you my story, Mr. Holmes. I quite understand, Mrs. Winthrop. My husband has lost his love for me. He's betrayed me. I have no reason to defend him. And lately he's been impossible. He behaves like a sadistic lunatic. Why haven't you told the police, Mrs. Winthrop? Because, Dr. Watson, I have no formal charge to make. I can't prove a thing. It's... It's just my instinct. I feel that he killed that poor girl and I will not harbor a killer. I need your help, Mr. Holmes. Well, the circumstances of the accident, Mrs. Winthrop, make it almost impossible to prove willful homicide. Where does your husband say he was on the evening of Margaret Ashley's death? He'd had a call, an emergency, quite far out of town. He claims that he left the carriage at home and took a cab. He was too tired to drive himself. He claims that when he reached the address given him, there was no such place. So he came home again. Oh, it's very flimsy. Did he give you the name of the patient who'd called him on this <clears throat> wild goose chase? Perkins. Mrs. Thomas Perkins. I did some investigating on my own. I telephoned every Thomas Perkins in the directory. None of them ever heard of Dr. Winthrop. Did your husband mention this supposed patient who vanished? Not a word. But, Mr. Holmes, you must find the evidence quickly. He knows I suspect him, and I'm afraid of what he might do. I shall move as quickly as possible, Mrs. Winthrop. Come, Watson, we shall speak first with Peter, the doorman, the witness to the accident. I'm ready, Holmes. We shall move very cautiously, Watson, if we value our own lives. But this is an elusive murderer of great talent. A talent for slaughter in a sudden and surprising way. With June just around the corner, you can expect a sudden heat wave any day. And that means many men will rush into Clippercraft stores for new smart, cool, lightweight suits. So, to get the very best in service, the widest selection and prompt attention, it's smart to come in now for your Clippercraft summer suit. And it's smart at any time to buy your suits from the fine local store that sells famous Clippercraft lightweight suits at only $33.75 to $42.50. The exceptional quality of Clippercraft clothes is guaranteed by the Clippercraft label in every suit and sport jacket, the trademark derived from the staunch Clipper ships that established honest New England quality everywhere in the world. You can always rely on Clippercraft clothes and the store that proudly sells them. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes bearing the Clippercraft label. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, sport jackets, and tropicals. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abram and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. <laughs> Dr. Watson, Dr. Watson, you and Mr. Holmes were racing to speak with Peter the Dorman backstage of the theater where Margaret Ashley died. There's Mr. Harris, where the enchanting Margaret was killed by a passing carriage. That night, Holmes and I stood in the dark, twisted alley by the stage door, under a pale moon, talking with the Dorman. You say, Peter, you had a glimpse of the driver of that carriage? Yes, Mr. Holmes, I did. He was wearing an eye hat and a cape. The cape was purple. I could see it flying in the wind. Did you see his face? No, it was too dark, and he passed like fury. Hmm. Did you recognize the carriage? At first, I didn't. You mean that you remember it now? Well, in a way, Dr. Watson. It looked to me like... Well, it isn't very discreet of me, but seeing as this is so serious a matter, it looked to me like the carriage of a certain gentleman. What well, often comes to see Miss Ashley. Oh, you see, Holmes? Do you know the gentleman, Peter? No, I'm sorry, Doctor. He never told me his name. And whenever he stepped out of the carriage, he was carrying orchids for Miss Ashley. And he held them up in front of his face, you see. And he held the cape up, too. A purple cape? Sometimes, Mr. Holmes, yes. He didn't want anyone to recognize him, I guess. It must have been one of those romances, what you read about in the papers, you know. Maybe he was a cabinet minister or some high mucky muck who was in love with Miss Ashley. Yes, yes, quite. Would you know the gentleman were you to see him? Not by his face, Mr. Holmes. That makes it even more difficult, eh, Holmes? More than you would imagine, Watson. Even if the doorman here did recognize our men, that wouldn't prove the accident was deliberate. Peter, after the accident, did you notice anything curious uh, about the body or the street or any of the other circumstances? 
I found a flower. Fell out of the carriage. An orchid. Well, again, an indication of our man. I say it's him, all right. Except I don't like to send a man to the gallows just on my say so. No, no, no. Thank you, Peter. You've been rather helpful. Oh, where to now, Holmes? Every forest in the district, Watson. We have the rope. We must now draw the noose tighter and tighter. That's the door to Dr. Winthrop's house, Holmes. Let's just keep an eye on it. Mrs. Winthrop said he'd be leaving about this hour. Once he's gone, we can speak to her and look at the house and search for clues. But we must have him for out of the way first. Holmes, that florist, he recognized the photograph of Dr. Winthrop. Said he always bought flowers there. But he wasn't there on the night of Margaret Ashley's death. You seem very impressed, Holmes. Confounded why? Shh, shh. Look, shh. look, Watson, there he goes. He's leaving his wife now. See? Yeah. As he's going down the street. She's waving goodbye to him from the doorway. Attractive blonde, isn't she? Why should he lose interest in her, for the sake of that actress? Fascinating as that province may be, Watson, it is not within the bounds of my territory. Now come across the street, he's out of sight. I'll ring, Holmes. Oh, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, he's just left. Will he return shortly? No, no, we've time. Come in. Well, lovely home, Mrs. Winthrop. It was, Dr. Watson, until the shadow fell across it. But I've been living in this house with a man I know as a murderer. Uh, that is your husband's consulting room, Mrs. Winthrop? Oh, yes. Yes, he does all his work down here. The drawing room and the bedrooms are upstairs. Maybe go up? Yes, certainly. But, Mr. Holmes, you must find the evidence. I can't stand it. I'm so afraid all the time. He's going to kill me, too, you know. I saw him alone in his office last night. He didn't know that I could see him in the mirror. He had a scalpel in his hand, and he was fingering it like... like... Oh. Then there's another thing. The night before, we took the underground to go to the theater. I was on the edge of the platform. I realized it just in time. He was standing directly close behind me. He could easily have pushed me in front of the train. Then there are poisons here in this cabinet. He opened the cabinet just before he left. He must have stood gazing at it for a full five minutes. He'd never done that before, Mr. Holmes. Well, calmly, Mrs. Winthrop, but, calmly. But... Come along, Watson. We shall search every inch of these quarters. Uh, by George Holmes, we've, we've gone through every room. No letters from Miss Ashley, nothing at all here. Not a scrap of evidence. Mm. Mrs. Winthrop, in which wardrobe does your husband keep his clothes? Oh, here, Mr. Holmes. But you'd better hurry. This has taken a great deal of time. He may be back soon. Looking for the outfit he wore the night he drove the carriage, Holmes? Aha! Uh -huh. The purple cape, trousers, double-breasted jacket to match, and on this shelf, a high silk hat. Oh, please be careful. I never touch his things. If he suspects that anyone's been in his wardrobe, he'll have another one of his fits. I see. Well, I believe this concludes the search, Mrs. Winthrop. Yes, but have you found anything? We'll discuss it downstairs, then we can slip out of the back door. Yes, Well, yes, Holmes, should we risk Mrs. Winthrop's life again for another night? Wouldn't you advise her to leave on some pretense until you have the facts that you want? I have the facts, Watson. Really? Facts oh, which but... prove I killed Margaret Ashley? Dr. Winthrop. Charles, I didn't hear you come in. I came in very quietly through the front door, Elizabeth. I heard voices upstairs. I kept very still and waited for you. You scheming, conniving... My arm! You break my arm! I just want to keep you close to me, that's all. If you move, <laughs> Mr. Holmes or Dr. Watson... I'll take this scalpel I have in my other hand, and I'll drive it into my wife's back. Charles, please listen to me. It won't help to kill me. Mr. Holmes will see that you die for it because he knows now. You sent for him, didn't you? You wouldn't believe my story. I'd like to kill you slowly, Elizabeth. You should suffer a bit. Need strokes of the scalpel to cause unbearable pain. But a slow death, the same slow death you've given me... With your suspicion, your accusations... Killing your wife now would accomplish nothing, Dr. Winthrop. It would to me. <clears throat> I don't care about the consequences. I said killing your wife would not be necessary, Dr. Winthrop. His Majesty's hangman will do that. What? I said His Majesty's hangman will do that. Well, I... I don't know what you mean. I... 
He dropped his scalpel, Watson. Quickly pick it up. Yes, I, I have it, Holmes. I wanted to be sure you didn't pick it up, Mrs. Winthrop. Since you drove Dr. Winthrop's notorious carriage, since you killed Margaret Ashley. I did? Mr. Holmes, that's preposterous. Both the door, Watson, and guard it well. Yes, right. Elizabeth, my... My wife killed Margaret? Precisely, Doctor. When Watson and I visited the forest where you regularly purchased orchids for Margaret, he told us that you hadn't been in his shop on the night of her death. It struck me as odd. Perhaps you purchased the orchids elsewhere, eh? Of course, Holmes, that doesn't prove... No, one moment, Watson. The driver of the carriage dropped an orchid on the cobblestones of the alley. The doorman told us that. Would a man stop to purchase orchids for Miss Ashley when he knew he wouldn't see her, but intended to run her down with the carriage? Definitely not. But you accused me. Exactly. Who else would have borrowed your husband's carriage? In the bedroom, you told us that you never touched your husband's things. But you had, Mrs. Winthrop. You're guessing, Mr. Holmes. You're unable to prove one iota. Your husband's purple cape, identified by the doorman, was draped over his double-breasted jacket. The jacket was neatly buttoned. You see, it was buttoned, Mrs. Winthrop, to the left, not to the right. The way a woman wears such a jacket. Elizabeth. You are a blonde, Mrs. Winthrop. And in the lining of your husband's high silk hat, I noticed a long, blonde hair. So, Holmes. You called your husband that night, Mrs. Winthrop, to get him out of the house. You were the non-existent Mrs. Thomas Perkins. You gave him a false address far on the outskirts of London. Then you put him into a cab, convincing him that he was too tired to drive himself. You put on his clothes. You took his carriage. You purchased orchids. You killed Margaret Ashley, being careful to make the cape very conspicuous and to drop an orchid so that the doorman's testimony would indict Charles. You're quite right, Mr. Holmes. She wasn't satisfied with Margaret's death. She wanted to see me die, too, to hang for the murder. Yes, she painted a vivid portrait of you as a murderer, Dr. Winthrop. Remember, Watson? The underground, the medicine cabinet, all lies. And Elizabeth, you, you knew all along about Margaret. For months, Charles. It just took a bit of time to plan my vengeance on both of you. Well, call the yard, Watson. Come and fetch a prisoner. Now, my dear Mrs. Winthrop, I observed you once that proving this was willful homicide was almost impossible. I should have added that nothing short of genius could accomplish it. Well, Dr. Watson, that was a very astonishing development to find that Mrs. Winthrop had driven the doctor's carriage. Well, if surprises are your dish, Mr. Harris, then you've something to look forward to in the adventure I shall relate next week. And uh, what do you call that memoir, Doctor? Next week, Mr. Harris, I shall relate to you the adventure of the curious crypt. It concerns a bow-legged man, a weird laugh, and a taste in silver. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and more than 1,200 stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and the program is produced and directed by Basil Lochran. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by George Spelvin. This week's story was written by Howard Merrill with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. The disabled veteran is paid to make the poppy you are wearing. He needs your support. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the adventure of the curious crypt. This is Cy Harris speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.